Hello everyone, I'm Michelle Pekansky Brock and welcome to this Hangout on Air. This is part of the Learn with Michelle series which is brought to you by Academic Partnerships. I'm very happy to have you and our guest here today, Rhonda Callister. Um, if you'd like to learn more <coughs> about the uh, Learn with Michelle series, you can go to facultyecommons.org and learn more about it there and sign up for a newsletter. Be notified about future upcoming events. We have hangouts with educators who share lots of great things that they're doing about how emerging technologies are reshaping teaching and learning in higher education today. And I'd like to extend an opportunity to you you to come share with me just like Rhonda has done today. Um, I'm always looking for new and exciting practices from college educators about how um, emerging technologies are uh, making active student learning experiences um, occur online, blended, and all kinds of different types of um, formats. So excited to have Rhonda here because she has a, a, a pretty great um, experience to share with everyone, especially those of you who are new to online teaching. And um, I know that online teaching is something that brings a whole new set of challenges and opportunities to professors. So um, I know that I'm not the only one who's going to really uh, applaud Rhonda for being willing to share with us today. So with that said, let me introduce Rhonda. Rhonda is a professor in the Department of Management in the Huntsman School of Business at Utah State University. And uh, Rhonda, let me just say hello to you and um, thank you for being here today as our hello. guest. Hello Michelle, I'm glad to be here. This is a fun thing to do. It is fun, thank you. See it's not so scary. A lot of times it can be a little nerve-wracking but I always tell people it's actually a lot more fun than, than you expect it to be. So um, thanks for that. Rhonda, why don't you tell us a little bit about this course? It's an online negotiations course, right, that, that you taught for the That's first right. time, and you just wrapped it up, actually, a few weeks ago. It, it That's finished right. up, right? The end of June, yes. At the end of June. And um, tell us a little bit about the course, set the stage for us, and just kind of get us, get us warmed up to, the, to, to what we're going to learn about. Okay, well, last year our department made the decision to take our master's program to an online to an online program we've had a campus campus program mm -hmm. and we and the on campus and we wanted to reach the population better reach the population of working adults sure. it's a master's degree in human resources and and we knew there was a market throughout the state so to do that, we set up the program in seven-week modules, and with seven-week modules, if they take two classes at a time, they can complete the program in a year. If they take one class at a time, they can complete the master's degree in two years. So, so there was the challenge of, of well, and I, I had taught the, the same course in the seven-week module on campus. So as we began discussing, um, this conversion process of going to online, each time we'd walk out of a meeting, a different one of my colleagues would turn to me and say, how are you going to teach your class mm -hmm. online? And the reason that they were so skeptical is that negotiations are typically a synchronous process mm -hmm. where you have two people in the same room negotiate, you're either buying a car or you're negotiating a job offer or <clears throat> or with your colleagues how the work's going to get done or resolving disputes and it's typically a face-to-face -face synchronous process. The problem is that online teaching is purposely asynchronous so that students can work at their own time. So how do you, and, and the ideal is to have students negotiate with each other so that they practice and to do that you would typically have them interact synchronously and how do you make that happen in an online environment? So there was a great deal of skepticism. Mm -hmm. And so what were your initial kind of thoughts going through that? Were you just, no, I can do this? Or were you kind of on the side of skepticism too? Or where yeah, were you yeah, at? I was, I was pretty confident it could be done. Um, and I also was just committed that it was an important thing to do. I really believe in access mm -hmm. of education. And this would greatly expand the access of graduate education to to students that wanted that kind of degree, wanted that kind of career advancement. So I was really committed to the idea and I thought I could do it. And the first thing I thought of was something called a doodle poll for scheduling. 
Okay. And I'd use this particular tool. And let's pull that slide up. Okay, okay. Yeah, we have some slides that we're going to show you. Um, and let me get that, that pulled up here for you. And I think, so Rhonda, you're going to take us through kind of how you, how you resolve these challenges, yes. right? Yes, because okay. that was the first and biggest challenge is how do you have a synchronous component to an asynchronous class. Okay. And I'm going to pull those slides up for Rhonda so you'll be able to see them, folks, and still be able to watch Rhonda go through her discussion here. And this is the, just the home page for DoodlePull, DoodlePull.com. And you can see that they have times across the top and people's names across the bottom. And what this was designed for was meeting scheduling. So someone that creates a poll sends out, pl plugs in the times when they might want to meet, and then they send that send it out to the email of each of the people they want to fill it out and then the person writes their name down and then checks or clicks on the box of the times that are acceptable for them and it's very easy to look and say all three people are available at 11 o'clock on July 19th or whatever. Um, so that's and this, how it's, this clearly isn't the synchronous part, though, right? I mean, no, no, obviously, no, when, no, no. yeah. This what is, you're, what you're, but what I, I mean, and I didn't mean anything by that. What I meant was that what you're clarifying for us is that there's yeah. a lot more to negotiations than just yes. the synchronous interactions. Right. I mean, for me, someone who's never taught negotiations, this is, you know, this opens up the complexities of your of your discipline, right? Yes. Because I mean, I just think, oh, you bring some people in a room and then you kind of assess what they did. So there's obviously a lot more to these activities than just that. Yes. And on campus, you do just bring people in a room. They show up at class and you say, okay, you two negotiate, you two, you know, you hand out the pieces of paper for the buyer and the pieces of paper for the seller to the left side of the room and the right side of the room and say, okay, just find somebody with the opposite color piece of paper and go negotiate. So it's really easy in a classroom setting. And so what is it that they're, they're, set, they're signing up here for specific time times? They're, they're not so, signing up for roles yet. Um, no, what we, we, we email out the roles in advance. So we know okay. who has which role, half buyers, half sellers, um, half, um, recruiters, um, employers, and half candidates if they're going to do a job negotiation. But we need to figure out how to get them together. Okay. And so so we have to have them sign up for times that they are available. And what I did is I took our seven-week class, and each week was a module. So I set aside three days of the module for negotiating and then four days for discussing. And during the negotiating three days, they would also do the reading for that unit, and then during the discussion, they would also be preparing for the next negotiation. Okay. So by dividing it, the, the modules into two sections, negotiating and discussing, I was able to narrow the window in which students had to focus on their availability, but okay. give them enough flexibility. So then within those three days, I gave them from 6 a.m. till midnight. So that, that turned out to be 54 possible times that they could choose to negotiate. And then I want, asked them to put as many possible, check as many possible boxes so that they'd have maximum um, chances of being able to match with somebody else. So yes, yeah, that goes on to the second one. So we had our list of 50, I had 50 students in my class, and then I had 54 time slots. And these accordion marks, show where it expands. You click on those and it expands to the full 54 slots. So quite a complex process. It, it is and what I discovered even though I thought DoodlePull was great, I'd used it a number of times for scheduling meetings, it turned out to be quite difficult and wieldy to use in this large frame because it didn't have the functions I wanted it to like an Excel spreadsheet might where you could lock the, the the names on one side and lock the times. So you'd get over out to the far right side and you couldn't see the names. You get towards the bottom, you couldn't see the times. And it became much more difficult to work with than I expected. So that was one of my big challenges. I had fortunately had a TA working with me, but each negotiation that he did, he spent four to five hours on the matching process. Mm -hmm. So that and support was really important. It, to it was it was critical and it was also makes me think there's got to be a better way of doing this. But mm -hmm. um, then he would send out an email telling them who their match was, what time it was, and where to do their negotiation. So that um, 
so so it worked it did what it needed to do but I also left feeling I got to think of a better way and I think I've got a plan for next year <laughs> and my plan for next year is I believe I'll use a Google spreadsheet and I can set it up similar to this but I can customize it lock the titles lock the names and lock the times and scroll around it more easily um, it'll take a little longer to, for me to set up because doodle was very very easy to work with very easy for the students um, but but the TA also had to keep track of who had which role so that he was matching making sure he's matching the buyers with the sellers each time mm -hmm. so it was fairly more complex than I anticipated sure but one of the um, so what I'll do next time is is work with the Google Doc, have a column for buyers and have a column for sellers. And I'm thinking I may experiment with letting the students find their own matches, asking them to put times in, and then to be scanning all of those with opposite roles uh -huh. to find a time, and then write their their name next to them in the in the buyer category if, okay. if they find a seller. Okay. And I think it'll take a little while for them to learn it, so I'll still need my TA monitoring really closely the first time, but by the second time I think they'll probably get the hang of it. And Rhonda, just to note, because I'm sure there's some folks who are interested in knowing, um, what was the tool that you used for, for actually the, the synchronous negotiations? Very good question. I was going to get to that. Okay. The, we used Adobe Connect, which is a video, video conferencing software, and it's very similar to WebEx. And many universities have either WebEx or Adobe Connect access. So we, ha I, we had our technology person set up six rooms in Adobe Connect that we could then, when they got the email of who they were going to negotiate with at what time, and um, we could also give them their room number, which w involved a link, a web link to the room, and they would go into the video conferencing room. Th and that brings. Go ahead. I was just going to ask. Um, a lot of times, folks think about using a, a free tool like Skype and extending that to students. So why didn't you consider using something like Skype? Okay, Skype can be very effective, and students are so familiar with Skype. Anybody, almost all of them, have used Skype. The problem was that it only allowed two people at a time for the free version, and at two of my negotiations involved a third person. When there was a dispute, they brought in a manager to help them solve the dispute, and we needed three people to be able to interact together. And just to clarify, that two people at a time is specific to the video, right? Right. And the video was a really important part for you for meeting your objectives. That I wanted students to be able to have face-to-face -face communication, to, gotcha. to make it as similar as possible to being in the same room with somebody um, when they're negotiating with their boss or doing a job offer negotiation where they're looking face-to-face -face and using those visual cues. Gotcha. So in order for the students to use Skype, they would have had to have premium accounts. Right. Okay. Okay, thanks and for that. Adobe Connect was free with our university's license. So okay, should I go to the next slide? No, let me let me just finish this Adobe okay. Connect part. One of the what, one of the problems we found with it, and I'm sure people have had some of the, this problem with Skype, is um, they found often there was a lot of static in it, and the voice quality wasn't clear unless they used um, earphones. So mm -hmm. some students immediately figured out they needed earphones, plugged them in, used them all the time, and it was no problem. Others didn't figure that out, and so their workaround was to call each other on the cell phone and use the video part of Adobe Connect mm -hmm. so that they could have three people or two people or whatever. So they figured out a workaround. Next time I'll put it in my syllabus and tell them that earphones work better or you can use cell phones if you don't have earphones, but it was just something I didn't anticipate and didn't uh, didn't tell them in advance. At the end of class, I asked for feedback, and that's when I... You know, and it's them. great It's great listening to you share all of this because, you know, what you're really demonstrating, I mean, to everyone that is listening and that will be watching the archive is that when you teach an online class the first time, you know, you learn from it. You learn so much right. from it, right? You right. learn, yes. okay, well, this yes. worked. I mean, it worked, but it could be better. Right. So what are my takeaways? What can I improve and how can I improve it? And so you're yes. sharing all that with us and it's this scaffolded process of making improvements every time, which is great. Yes, and I, and I love that process of continuing to learn and figuring out how to do it better. And the mm -hmm. first time through is, I think, where you get your maximum learning and figuring out. And then I'll con sure I'll continue to tweak it over the years as I, as I teach the class. Yeah. 
and as new tools continue to surface right, and you right. think, oh, that would work better than this even, right? Yes, yeah. yes. Right. Okay. So should I go the, back to the slides? Yes, let's go back to the slides. Okay. So, and I want to explain that one other important part of a negotiation class is knowing something about how your outcomes compare to other people's outcomes. And so in order to do that, once they finish negotiation, Nego okay, let's stop here. Once I finished negotiating, I asked the students to record what their outcome was. And this negotiation was called Where's Alvin? And the students would write their names. These are fictitious names. And then they'd write a description of what they agreed to. So I, half of my negotiations were qualitative, where they had to solve a problem. And this is a problem solving one where there was something missing at work. So the boss has to co confront the employee and, and try and figure out how. Um, if the employee was involved in some theft. So it's a very um, heavy ethical overtones. And th so they recorded their agreement and then how satisfied they were with the agreement. And you can see the first one was a four and a three. The employee, Pat, was not too satisfied. Um, then some of my negotiations, half of them were quantitative, where they're actually scored and they got point values. Let's go to the next slide. So this international lodging merger is one that's points um, scored. So students can, well, the points will total at the end and they can find out exactly how well they did in comparison to their peers. So this is where they click, did they agree to one or two, three or four seats on the board and what are they going to name the new properties after they merge? Let's go to the next slide. And then here they talk about how they're going to manage the properties, how much compensation the managers will get. On their based on their performance, and then there's another business that are going to sell. How much that could or could not be included. So they fill, they click on all the boxes, and then this data is down. And this is one of the where we kind of push the technology beyond my comfort zone. I wasn't really familiar with it before, but this data is downloaded into a Google spreadsheet with the formulas which I had already figured out the formulas to calculate the total points for the students. So let's go to the the last slide here. Here this, um, it enters the, the first and last name of each student and then the total points. The top line was the total possible. AAA had a total possible of 370 points, Lambert 172, for a maximum possible of 542. And I like to teach the students that joint totals matter because of um, you get low joint totals. You've left a lot of value you haven't claimed in the the agreement becomes less stable. But what's interesting here is that where it says, you see two thirds of the way down, no agreement below this point should have been signed. That's because the triple A side had another offer that was worth 250. So we had eight students, a few were cut off, eight students that came to agreement that were lower than their other offer. And this is a common mistake that's made in negotiations, but it's so powerful for them to be able to look at this comparative spreadsheet and see that they were right at the bottom of the class, that they shouldn't have made an agreement, that they should only have made an agreement if they had 250 points or more. And I believe that failure experiences are the most powerful learning experience. I can tell them forever that negotiators often make lousy deals because they don't pay attention to what their alternative is, but until they've made that mistake and are kicking themselves for it, they won't remember. And, and this is a powerful way to really nail that point. So that so these, these spreadsheets that are generated after they enter their agreements um, are then posted online and then I ask them to ask questions in the discussion for them to refer to how they did in comparison to that. Do they do any kind of reflection about that? About, you know, how what their outcome was like and what they what they took away from it? Just listening to what you say about how important that failure experience right. is. That, that's part of the discussion. So I set up several um, questions where I asked them to integrate what they read that week and also what they experienced that week and what they learned from the experience. So that's, I have a set of questions that are based on the specific negotiations. Mm -hmm. And so I do get some good reflections and some good responses to those reflections. Great. That's so powerful. That's one of the things I love about teaching online is that opportunity to, to not only have them um, I think the students be maybe more reflective through the asynchronous discussions, but then also for me to actually dig in and learn from those reflections myself. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
Fabulous. You explained and shared so much there, and I feel like I am so much more aware and informed about what goes into negotiations um, and how to teach them more effectively online. So a couple of questions, and we had one, one question come in from, from Twitter. Um, and by the way, if, there's, if there is anyone watching, I didn't mention this, it is on the bottom of the screen on, um, let me make my image larger here for you so you can see it, but if anyone is watching and if you do have a question and if you are a Twitter user, you're welcome to send your question using the hashtag learn, it's L-E-A-R N-W-M-P-V, which stands for Learn with MPV, um, and I am watching the feed come in, and I'm happy to present your question to Rhonda here in the in the 10 minutes or so that we do have left. But Annabelle um, Pacheco, and I apologize if I'm saying your name wrong, has asked, how about using Google Plus Hangouts on Air for the synchronous interactions? It's free, and it allows you to record the session to your YouTube channel, which is basically what we're doing here exactly. Yes, yes. Yeah. I, I think that would be an excellent possibility, especially if somebody's already f familiar with and comfortable with Google Hangouts. No problem. There's lots and lots of options. I ended up with Adobe Connect because I was working with our technology specialist, and he said, How, here, let me set you up on Adobe Connect. So that's what we went yeah. with. But there, so, so I guess moving forward, now what you can start yeah. thinking about is kind of weaving in some options for students. Right. Um, and, you know, I, that's one thing I was thinking about also because there are these um, Hangouts comes with a great mobile app also. So students can yes. actually participate with video from a smartphone or a tablet and so forth so it makes it even more accessible to them and it lets them use their mobiles as as video tools which is really pretty fabulous for students who are accessing yes. learning from anywhere right which is really right. making it more student centered and accessible to the students so that's that's a fabulous suggestion um, and staying on that note you've mentioned a lot of um, things about improvements but let's talk about Let's talk about how the learning was. You know, what was, how were the learning <coughs> outcomes? You know, you went into this and you shared a little bit about the challenges and kind of some of that skepticism going into it. You mentioned that you were pretty optimistic, thinking, I can do this, I can do this. But now that the first run of the course is over and you're looking back at it, I imagine, you know, you've seen the scores, you've seen your student feedback, and what were the learning outcomes like? How did it go? I was really pleased um, on multiple levels. First of all, the final exam is a comprehensive um, final exam, and the students did perform very comparably to my campus class. I just I finished that in May and then immediately started the online class after that. So the outcomes were very similar. There are a few um, several questions I watch for to see if they've gotten the basics, and um, they then the online class performed every bit as well as the campus class. I was really pleased. I was also pleased because I asked for feedback at the end and and while I got suggestions I didn't I didn't get any great frustrations. Any you always worry about technology that things will go wrong and there'll be some really frustrated students out there. But um, I got a few little suggestions on tweaking this and that and a lot of very positive comments. This was about the fourth or fifth online class in the program and so they had some comparisons and they were and they were being positive. They felt it was a good learning experience. They felt like they developed their skills over the course Great. of the class. Great. That's so I, I was happy. I was very happy. Well, congratulations. That sounds like a very positive yeah. uh, first time online teaching experience, Rhonda. Congratulations to you. Um, so thinking, uh, you know, about the, the next couple of, you know, renditions of the course, again, you've pointed out a number of improvements that you're kind of thinking about. Right. Um, something that I'm curious to just kind of dig in with you is um, this, you've, you've clearly made it, you know, you stressed how important the synchronous interactions are and the, the seeing the, the, the gestures to the, the synchronous video and so forth. Um, but I'm also really picking up on how labor intensive that process is for you. Right. And also, you know, you may start having more students who are international and that may become more of a challenge for the student experience, right, to, to actually find time in those specific slots for the synchronous session. So I guess what I'm wondering is are you thinking at all about maybe um, weaving in maybe one asynchronous 
negotiation in the future? Is that something you've pondered and how are you feeling about that? Because that could alleviate, you know, some of the challenges on both the instructional side and potentially, you know, make it more student centered also. Um, yes, I, I, I have been thinking about, I haven't made a final decision on wh what negotiation, but I am thinking about converting at least one of the negotiations to asynchronous. And I was really encouraged when I talked to a colleague who, of mine who also teaches negotiations in another university. She's doing purely campus classes rather than online, but she tried an asynchronous negotiation even in her campus class where she had them do the entire negotiation by chat. So, so sent, you know, sent, sent a chat, the respondent would have time to think about it and then respond at some later point. And then she did a satisfaction survey with the students that participated and she found a lot of satisfaction with the chat version of negotiation, um, especially from students that were English as a second language mm. because it gave them more time to think. And I do see that in my own students. If they've got a 30 minute period or an hour period, they have to get through it. So they sometimes they don't total their numbers as well as they could. Sometimes they get a little lost in the issues. And having a little more time to think does have some value. And some of our negotiations are actually asynchronous. House negotiations, for example. Uh, you present an offer and then you have some time to think and respond. That's true, right. So, so I think that it would be appropriate and I will do it one at a time, I'll, and I'll have to see if I, I can still navigate all the learning objectives yeah, but right. have, and have it make sense that, that, that they're taking time to respond. So I think it's going to be really worthwhile to try at least one, an asynchronous one and see how it works and then see if I can incorporate that because it is realistic to have some, and I've thought of that just during this course. And then also I think by going to students matching themselves with a Google spreadsheet will reduce my setup time. It might increase theirs, but it'll give them more flexibility on, on choosing the exact time they want to negotiate. It'll mm -hmm. give them more incentive to get on quickly and, and try and set it up quickly rather than knowing that somebody's going to take care of it for them so they're not in a hurry. Anyway, yeah. so a couple tweaks. Yes, I'm definitely yeah. going to look into that. And we just got a tweet from Sarah Linden who um, took the words right out of my mouth, Sarah. I was just going to say that um, a tool that I use, an asynchronous tool that I use, um, and again, depending on what outcomes you're tying it to, if you are interested in tying it to more of a real world outcome with, you know, I mean, I think negotiations for, um, you know, real estate sales would be more right. kind of like a text-based um, right. asynchronous interaction or negotiation, I should say. but. VoiceThread is a tool that I've used quite a bit, which is asynchronous, and it provides actually video uh, interactions okay. between individuals. And it's one of the very few asynchronous tools that you can find that integrates the video interactions. And so it's very unique in that way, and it might be something to consider. So yes, yes, wanted to share that also. Um, well, thank you. We are at the end of our of our thirty minute um, hangout here, and I just want to reach out and say say thanks one more time to Rhonda Callister from Utah State for being here. Uh, I I learned a lot from you, and I know that everyone who viewed the live hangout did too, and those who view the um, the archive because it will continue to live on through archive form, will continue to learn from you. Um, and I again want to encourage more of you to share with me. So please go to facultyecommons.org and um, look for Learn with Michelle and reach out to me and let me know what it is, all the great stuff that you're doing in your classes with online teaching and emerging technologies and step up and, and, and share with me. Um, thanks for being here, everyone. Have a great day and I'll see you next time. Take care, Thank Rhonda. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. I appreciate it.